back here. We were gone a couple weeks and uh, continuing on now in that transformation series. Took a little break for a few months there. I gave you a lot in the first three. And so with all the things going on at the beginning of summer, I thought, well, let's take a little bit of a break here. And so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about with the transformation series, it's eight sessions on, on perhaps hoping that this year uh, something changes in our in our walk, and our relationship with the Lord. And so um, we're going through these eight sessions. Um, today we'll be in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. And uh, we have a whole group of us doing this, not only this church, but several other churches. Last week we got to introduce it to a new church. And, and so they're on Facebook. We've got maybe about 100 people that are all in this group. Not everybody participating in it. Some of you is just kind of creeping in there, looking. And I see us. I'm creeping on your creep, I guess. I see us watching. And uh, so we want to just en uh, encourage you to join in with us. We do have some questions up here. So uh, in the front seat here, if you're going through it with a transformation partner and you want to join in this month, feel free to join us. Um, session one was the hope of transformation. And if you remember, I asked you the question, do you want a life that's transformed? And your response was yes. And then... The second part of that is, do you want help in the transformation? And you responded, yes. And the third question was, do you give your entire self to the transformation? And I left that between you and the Lord and uh, didn't call for you to answer right there. If you said yes to all three of those, then session two was the measure of the transformation. Now, we've got to keep track of what the Lord is doing in us and through us and around us in our life. And so there are multiple different things that we did in that session, and then there was session three, which was the honesty of the transformation, and is really just kind of getting to the point and finding out what areas of your life you really want to see transformation with the Lord, and being specific about that, and just being completely honest with the Lord. Can't hide from the Lord, and you shouldn't be lying to the Lord, right? So just be honest with the Lord, what's going on in your life, and be honest with your transformation partner, what's going on. And I mentioned to you that maybe if one transformation partner is, is not enough, that maybe you grow that group a little bit. And so here we were, three sessions, busy, busy, busy. And then there's session four, just be still. So if you want transformation, be still in the transformation. And that's where we're going to be today. Mark chapter 4. Many, many verses we could talk about. Today we'll be talking about a place of silence, a place of solitude, a place to pray and to talk to the Lord. And all these verses and all these passages are about prayer. And I've chosen Mark 4, which weeks ago was in our reading plan. When I read this, what is what is prayer but a conversation with the Lord and, and speaking from the heart? And so while this passage doesn't have people on their knees or people folding their hands or bowing their heads, there is a conversation with the Lord and a crying out to Him. December 8th, if you look it up on Wikipedia, December 8th, all different things have happened in history. I mean, many, many famous people born, many famous people passing on December 8th, all of these catastrophes that have happened on December 8th, there are wars uh, being declared on December 8th. And December 8th means something to me. December 8th, 1980. I've shared this story perhaps before with you. I just want to share it again because I believe it goes along with what I'm going through here today. December 8th, 1980, I was having a surgery. And it wasn't a life-threatening surgery by any means, but it was, you know, to a 12-year-old, surgery, surgery. It's, it's pretty scary, right? And I remember the morning of it. I, now, this is a long, drawn-out thing, 12, you know, when I'm 12 years old. you got to be there the day before, stay overnight to prepare for it. You're going to be in the hospital three days. Now, they would have you, like, in and out and back to work within two hours. I'm pretty sure of it. But that wasn't the case. I remember waking up that morning, and... Uh, the morning of it, it's still kind of dark in the room, and, and the sun's just coming up, and I went over to the window and just kind of looked out the window and saw some people walking on the sidewalk, and I thought to myself, man, I would just give about anything to be able to trade in these hospital clothes and to put on regular clothes again and walk down that sidewalk and just have a regular day again. You know what days I'm talking about, the days that you just had this past week, or Lord willing, he gives us some more this week, the ones we take for granted that we just live in. And I'm looking out that window, and I'm thinking, 
man, just to have that day again. But before that happens, I've got to go through something that I'm very scared about. I've got to go through a surgery here. And the reason why it was scary was because of this. Yeah, I'm 12 years old. Anytime there's like danger or something that's really not going to be that great for me, guess who's around? Mom and dad are around to watch over and to protect and take care of. But listen, there's going to be a point here this day where they're wheeling me down the hallway, laying on the table, and, and there's going to be a doorway, and mom and dad will have to stop, and they'll continue moving me past that. They won't be able to go into the surgery room with me and help me this time, nor do I want them in there. And then I say to myself, well, listen, mom and dad can't help. Well, what about myself? And, and, and maybe... Is there something I can do? And the answer is no. There, there, there's nothing I can do to help myself. You know, it's the 80s. I'm not Doogie Hauser, right? I can't help myself here. And so then who else is there? Now I've got to tell you that growing up, we, we didn't go to church that much. We went on Christmas and we'd go on Easter and, and, and that was it. Every now and then we'd go too uh, on different occasions, but... That's all we'd go to church, and so you got to imagine if, if, if we don't go to church, I don't have a relationship with this God, and I certainly don't know how to pray. But here I am, standing at a window, and as best I knew how to, as a 12-year-old, I just said, God. And I can imagine the, the throne room of God just hearing this, this little 12-year-old voice just going, God, are you there? Can you hear me, God? Now, I don't recommend cutting deals with the Lord. Not to be known right now. I don't recommend that. But I'm 12, and I didn't know any better. And so I said, Lord, if you, if you get me out of here, you get me through this, I'll talk to you every day the rest of my life if I'm able to. And he did, and I have. 35 years later, December 8th this year, and I don't remember a day not talking to him. And I'll tell you that not so that I can brag on, on Jim Martin. I tell you that actually for other reasons, but, but it's certainly not to brag because I, I go back and I think about some of these prayers and some of these conversations. And listen, they're, they're not really authentic. There were times where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I, I forgot to talk to God. And so um, I got to go. I got to go. And, and it's just automatic and it's just check. Oh, I got him in today. I got him in today. And I think about prayers that were just this, this same boring kind of prayer all throughout. Here it is. It's one day after another. And it sounds so much like yesterday's prayer. Check, check, check. I think about before meals. Check. I think about in church. Check. There, there are certain points where we should pray. And, and, and then we pray here and we pray there. And is it coming from the heart? Check. So I'm not all that wowed or that impressed about prayer over the last 35 years. I've had my moments. Why do I tell you? It is because I believe that you can, you can look back at December 8th, 1980 and trace a line all the way to October 20th, 1992 where the Lord grabbed hold of my heart there in my pastor's home on the floor of his living room where I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I believe that December 8th, 1980 was this crisis and, and this awakening starting to happen inside of me spiritually that the Lord would bring to a different level 12 years later. And the second reason I bring that up today has to do with what we're going to read and has to do with what I'm speaking about. I got up that morning and, and went to a window, and there it was. It wasn't some, some fantastic place. It was the window of a hospital room where I got alone with God. And there has to be a place where we get alone with the Lord. And there was this great crisis that I thought lied before me, and, and there was the crisis. And then there it is trying to figure out how am I going to take care of this and I can't. And so I turn and I go to the one who can. And then he does as only he can. And as a result of it, there is a call upon my life and, and, and a response that I have to give. And that's Mark chapter 4 here. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. 
In Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35, it says, And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him, them in, it took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. It was, let's get away. Let's get in this boat and just get away from it. See all of these people, all of this commotion, all these people following them and wanting to see the next things that Jesus would do. And it's, let's just get away. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. There's the crisis. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. God is in control. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? They turned from the crisis and they turned towards Christ. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. God does as only God can do. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And here's what I believe to be their transformation that day. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And now God's word has gone forth this morning, and it shall accomplish that for which he purposed on this day, in this place, for these people. Do you believe that? Say amen. First thing I want to point out here this morning is that they got away to a place with the Lord, all the distractions set aside, and it's just time for them to spend with the Lord. You read other passages here in Mark chapter 6, after Jesus had sent, us out, sent out the twelve and they come back. It says the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught him, and taught, I should say. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And it says they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. And so busy. So busy in their life and all these things that are going on as they're following Jesus that, man, they forgot to eat. Now, see, I don't have that problem in life. I don't know about you guys. But I get my three in, my three meals. I might be thinking about how busy it is, but listen, as that, those words are coming out, there's a burger or something going in. I'm telling you, I don't get that busy where I don't eat. These guys are so busy that they're not even eating. And Jesus is like, listen, you've got to get away. You've got to take some time. Get in a boat and just go. Other passages, Matthew 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Get away. Spend some time alone. Do you have that place in your life where you go and you get away with the Lord? Do you? Where's your place? And, I, and I'm not looking for, you know, I love the mountains of Tennessee. Because that won't do you any good tomorrow unless you're going there. Where's the place? We're, we're all busy. We, I get that. We all got things to do. Is it, where is the place that you know tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? You got to go there. But I'm going to go there alone with the Lord. For me, it's simple. Five days a week, I know when I leave my front door and get to the front door of work, I've got five or six minutes and there is just beautiful landscape along the way and the sun's coming up and I see the fog and I see all the critters out there and the deer and I just thank the Lord for it. Every morning, Five minutes with the Lord. Where is your place? I encourage you to find that place each day that you could just spend time away from everything else. Now, I don't want to turn this into a systematic kind of thing. This is a relationship kind of thing. But listen, I think you've got to set up some things so that you can fall into this relationship. And so it's got to be simple. It's got to be consistent. It's like everything else. For years, struggling, we join a health club, we... Don't go to the health club. We start this diet. Uh, we stop that diet. You know what? Work's too busy. And, and when I'm not working, then there's ministry, and that keeps me away from stuff. And then, you know what? Well, I've got family, and there's leisure that keeps me away from constantly doing all this stuff. And then a neat little band comes out. And I can follow my steps everywhere I go. So now i got daily goals. And I just got to hit X amount of steps every day. And I can track it. It doesn't matter if I'm at work. 
Instead of picking up the phone and calling across the other end of the building, I get up and I walk there now. I got steps to take. At home, we go crazy. We got this little competition going, me and Angie. The other day, we had a little contest going, and she's yelling, where are you at? And I'm like, I'm in the back changing. For 10 minutes, I was just doing this in the room. I wanted to beat her. But there it is at home. And we had some leisure time a few weeks back, and, and, and we went to Chicago. Molly wanted to go shopping at a store, and so we drove to Lincoln Park Zoo there and parked the car and walked into Chicago, and walked around the shop and walked back to Lincoln Park and walked around the zoo, and we got in our points in all of it because it's practical. Listen, I got a 1,500-step sermon waiting for you today. <laughs> Just letting you know that right now. If you haven't been counting already, you don't know where I'm at. But it's practical. It, it's easy. you got to find a spot with the Lord that you know, I'm just going to get there every day so that you can spend some time with him. So you got this place. But then second, there's a, a crisis. Their, their boat is filling with water. Now, if you read this a few weeks ago in the reading plan, you probably just read it and, and you didn't think, oh, those poor men. We read history today, we read what's going on in our world, and we sympathize with what's going on. But listen, if we believe that to be God's word, we believe that to be truth, and we do, right? Then somewhere in history, there were some men that got in a boat that day, and it didn't go so good. And the waves were crashing, and the wind was whipping up, and all the water's coming in the boat. And they are minutes away from death. They are frantic at what's going on. They've got a crisis in their life right now. And when I mention the word crisis, there are some who are here today. The minute I mention crisis, you went to a spot. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Crisis in your life. And for others, you maybe didn't think of anything. Well, let me tell you, crisis is around all of us. It's at the door. If you don't think that crisis is around us, I'll, I'll challenge you this. Go ahead and wake up tomorrow and your heart doesn't work. How's that going to work out for you? You wake up tomorrow and the sun is gone forever. How's that going to work out for you? You wake up tomorrow and there's no oxygen or air to breathe. There's no food to eat. There's no money for anything in life. What are you going to do then? These are all great things that the Lord provides for us each day. And, and that, that calamity of that, if it's gone, He withholds that from us. And we spend time thinking about how great he is that he provides for us each day. Give us this day our daily bread. It isn't give us this day the bread forever. It's for this day what I need, Lord. To get through this day, there's crisis around us. I believe that the Lord uses crisis to, to draw those who have wandered right back to him. I believe the Lord uses crisis sometimes to start that spiritual awakening in a life like a 12-year-old standing in a hospital room. The Lord can use that crisis. Now listen, I want to go off track a little bit here. Not so much, but this will be the biggest point, and then the rest of the message just comes pretty quickly. But while we're talking about crisis... And I look around and I see all of the folks that are here today. I would just say that there is no greater crisis in this room and in our lifetime than those who are apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture says that you're born into sin and the wages of that sin is death. It's an eternal death, a separation from this holy God. Listen, there is no greater there is no greater crisis in our room, do you believe that, than, than to spend all eternity separate from God. We might suffer here for a little while. We might go through some trials and different things. But listen, if you know the Lord, you know the wonder of how we'll spend all eternity in his presence. With those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no greater crisis than that in this room. And so let's talk about that you who stand apart from him and you stand in your sins and you stand condemned what is the what is the fix for that well listen we know that 
that before the foundation of the world, this God, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they, they knew even before he spoke it into an existence that we would fail, that we would bring sin upon ourselves. And even before we did that, here's the plan. The plan to come back. And that plan involved his son, Jesus, who would step from heaven's glory and come here and put on flesh and he'd be God and he'd be man and he'd live this perfect and pleasing life for the Father and fulfill all that he needed to. Why? For him? Who did he do it for? Tell me, family of faith. Come on. Who did he do it for? For us. And he took that life and he went to a cross. And there he paid the penalty for that sin. Tell me, who should have paid that penalty, family of faith? I mean, we've got to speak this for today's message here and for our lives and for our transformation. We've got to speak that. And listen, on that cross, God's anger and wrath towards, towards that sin gets put on him. Who should that have been put on? And then he died a death that who should have died? Us. And at the end of that story, the, the great part of that story is that three days later, he who laid down his life would take it up again. He would rise, and in that, he would defeat sin and death and evil. And those who would say, listen, I, I realize I was born into this, and I don't want that anymore, and I want to turn from that, and I want to come towards this Christ. Though That's called repentance. I, Lord, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for my disbelief in the Son's. Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Scripture says you'll be born again. Right here, right now. Who did you do that for, family of faith? Have you received that? And I say that for two reasons. That's why I want that road. Is one is if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no greater crisis in your life than being apart from a relationship with him. You need to get there with him today. If you hear, if you feel that Holy Spirit working in your hearts and turning it, it, today is the day of your salvation. Repent of your sins and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, do you really, really believe with all of your heart that that plan of redemption is truth? I'm sorry, that was pretty weak. Do you believe that? Yes. If we believe that, if we believe that that is truth 100% and we can trust God with this plan of redemption. I mean, it's somehow amazing to think of this and we can't fully explain it no matter how hard we try. Given our own way, if God would have said, you fix this, we would have done all kinds of goofy things to try and earn the salvation. We would have done things. We would have paid for it. We would have done God's plan is amazing. We can't fully wrap our minds around it, but here we are, family of faith, and we sit here and we all say, yes, I believe that with all of my heart. My entire eternity rests in the fact that that is truth. But then over here we have our crisis. God, we can't trust you with all that. It's time to turn from all of this and give it to the one who can do something with it. I don't want to minimize anybody's crisis here today. But that's a pretty wild thing, that plan of redemption. And if he can work that out, and he has that, I, I got news for you. He can work out whatever it is that we have, whether it's a sickness, whether it's finances, whether it's relationships, whether it is just your transformation itself. He can do it. And so we have this place of getting alone with the Lord. We have this crisis, and we have Christ in control here. And we need to realize that, that Christ is in control. And as we read that, it said, where was Jesus? When all this storm and all these people are frantic, where is Jesus at this entire time? He's lying on a cushion, sleeping in the stern of the boat. Now listen, I'm not a big boat enthusiast, so I read about the stern. And where's the stern? It's the spot where who takes charge? The captain. The one who's in charge. The one who's in control. How neat it is that Jesus Christ is laying in the spot of control while all of this is going on around him. Now some of us, i got to believe, as we're going through our crisis and going through life, often wonder, can you hear me, God? 
Are you even there? We think sometimes he's asleep. Let me ask you, family of faith, Jesus, Jesus Christ is asleep in the stern of this boat. Do you think he knows what's going on around him? A great conversation, maybe, at, at dinner tonight. Do you think that Jesus knew exactly what was going on at the time? See, I do. I believe in, in this God who is in control at all times. Part of the homework this, this month is to go to various different scriptures to talk about how Jesus is in control. Colossians chapter 1 is a great one, starting there in verse 19, and he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation, and all things were created by him in heaven and on earth, invisible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ. Not just some things, if you believe that again to be true, all things hold together. That means all the major things going on in our world and all the wars and catastrophes, all of the, the major things, but then even that baby is getting her first tooth and the fever starts. He holds it all together. He holds together everything that's going on in your life. Christ is in control. And so they turn now. Here's where the story changes a little bit. They turn from the crisis and they turn towards Christ. And I love this in the story because this is, this is where the end of self-reliance is and the beginning of dependency on Christ. Well, I've been reading a bunch of books and commentaries and different things as I prepare for this series. I don't remember where, where I read this. I just remember reading this, this part in one of them where it talked about football, and so it stuck out because I love football. And it talked about all the planning and all the preparation and all the videos they got to watch in the preparation for game day. And then game day comes, and, and what do they do? They all get into this little huddle before every play, and, and the, the captain is like, listen, you're going to go that way, and you're going to go this way, and I'm going to go this way, and should they do this, we'll respond this way, and it's planned, it's planned. It's planned, and he hikes the ball, and they go. And they do that after every play, after every play, until the end of the game. Let's say they're down, and there's three seconds left, and they're midfield. There's a little different huddle then, and it sounds a little something like this. I'm going to snap the ball, I'm going to take that ball, and I'm going to fling it as far as I can that way. And where it's going to come down, I don't really know specifically. I just know that there's going to be like 10 or 12 pairs of arms waving up in the air trying to catch it. And we're going to just hope that it comes down in the arms of our team. They call it the Hail Mary pass. They get a little spiritual at the end of the football game. He writes, when we run out of time and opportunity, when human cleverness and mortal strength have failed me, when all other options are gone, it's Hail Mary time. Brothers and sisters, when we're, when we're in that boat in our life and everything's crashing around us and maybe it's the transformation, maybe it's something else that you went to, when all of it's crashing around us, when, when time and opportunity is, is gone, when human cleverness and mortal strength have failed you, when all other options are gone, it's Jesus Christ time. Amen? They cried out to him, and he responded. And when we have Christ around us and in us and working through us, listen, there is always, always hope. I like to think about the story and just go, and I think, man, how that story would have changed a little bit had they have known Jesus was in control before they stepped into that boat. They would have just fully realized that he was in charge. What would it have been like? We still would have had the waves, right? We still would have had the wind, but might there have been a little bit more peace, a little bit more calm? I think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? It's a great story. I love it. I've always loved that story. When, when the kids were little and Angie would go out and 
and she would uh, maybe have a Bible study or something she'd go to. We'd always make like a two-minute video and kind of leave it there for her when she'd get home to play. And, and uh, one time we did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but there's only like two kids. <laughs> so it was Shadrach, Meshach, and where did he go? Is what we named it. <laughs> and uh, I love the story. Now here's these men, and, and, and they're told, listen, I want you to bow down and worship this. The statue, and they're like, no, we won't worship anything but our God. And they go back and forth and back and forth, and they won't. They won't worship anybody but their, their true God. And they fire up that furnace even hotter, and they throw them in, and the men that throw them in, they die instantly. And sick as it was, they, they look into the furnace to check them out, and they notice that three men are walking around. Wait a minute. There's four. God is with them. And they said, even if, even if he didn't save them, they were going to do what? Still do it. Still do it. We always have to realize that Christ is in control, and then we be still, and we watch him work in our lives. Now, as we're studying this, one of the things that just floored me in this is that he's having a conversation with weather. I mean, Jesus gets up from this sleep and, and speaks to the wind. In this violent storm that's going on in the water, he speaks to the water. And, and even more amazing than that, it listened to him. Oh, wow. He's doing only as he can do. And it's pretty amazing. And so when you think of that great God who speaks and the world comes into existence, let there be light. And it's done. And you think of a God who speaks and rebukes the wind. And you think of a God who speaks and the waves just are still. That's pretty amazing. And to think that that God speaks to you today. And he speaks to you through his word. And he speaks to you through your brothers and sisters in Christ. And he speaks to you through a crisis or a circumstance of life. He speaks to you, according to Hebrews chapter 1, through his son, Jesus Christ. The question is, do we hear him? Are we so busy and so crowded out in, in this whole life that we have that we're over here and forgetting to eat a meal even? Do you hear him? And even more, do you speak with him? That's, that really blows the mind is that this God, with everything that's going on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, anytime you reach out to him, God, are you there? He's there. And he's ready for you. Have we lost the desire to spend time with that God, with that creator? What more could be more important than have that conversation with him? Think back your last week. Man, just even think the last 24 hours. What was more important than spending time, even just five minutes with the creator of the universe? And when you got talking, what was more important that you even wanted to stop? And we turn on that God dial and talk to him for a few minutes and we shut it off. What if we left it on and just had a relationship with him and just kept talking with him throughout the entire day. What if when we spoke to him, it wasn't calculated and, and planned out? What if it wasn't, we'll think of the best words we can say to him, and, and, and this will sound great, and that will sound great. What if it just come from the heart, like what he wants? Jesus says when you go there and, and you're praying, and when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words, don't be like them. Just talk to God. Let him know your heart. Let him know what, what's going on. C.S. Lewis writes this, Lay before him when praying what is in you, not what ought to be in you. I read that one twice. Lay before him what's in you, not what ought to be in you. Think about that when you're praying. Have you ever had a prayer where you're praying and then all of a sudden you drift? And now all of a sudden I'm thinking about work today. And then when I realize that, oh, got to get back over here because this is the proper thing to do. 
is to bring it back over here. Or I'm praying and, and maybe I got into a little bit of a scrape with somebody and, oh, can't have that while I'm talking to God. Got to clean this up a little bit and come back over here. Well, maybe it's just then that the Holy Spirit is just working in you and, and through you to say, listen, that's the very thing we need to deal with right now. Let's talk about it. That's truth. That's what's really going on in your life. Spend five minutes, if you haven't already, at least five minutes with the Lord each day. Get up and talk to Him. Enjoy Him. Thank Him for who He is and the wonderful God. Find something brand new, one thing every day to say, wow, thank you for that, God. Thank you for your son and what he's done. That you, Because of the work of the cross, I even have access to come and talk to you. God, I depend on you in this life and in my transformation. And spend time just in awe of this great God. Be still with him. And then, of course, here's where the transformation, I believe, comes. Because we read the rest of this story here, and it says this. and He says to them, after everything was calmed down, he says to them, why are you so afraid? I mean, you've seen everything I've done. You, you've heard about it. Now you just saw this. Why are you still afraid? Family of faith, we know all about this God. We, we just said we believe 100% that, uh, that this plan of redemption is true. Why are we still afraid? Do you have not any faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And it's right there that I kind of looked at it and thought, You know what? All of this going on in her life, and you can fill in what all that is for you, and you can fill it all in for what, what it is for you, and the busyness and the fears and the worries here and, and this and that. And they turned from that. And they say, you know what, I can't handle all of this. And they come to the one who can, and they turn to him, and it's, wow. Who do we have here? That even the wind and the sea listens to him. Brothers and sisters, that's my prayer for you as you go through this next month, is that you just get some time alone with the Lord I mean, you want transformation. Just all of this stuff that's going on here, including the transformation, take it and go to the one with it who can do something about it and turn. Turn from the crisis and turn to Christ and go, wow, what an amazing God we have. And he lets us enjoy him every day. Why don't we stand for prayer and then continue our worship this morning. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. And you've given us so much and withheld so much. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be working in this room to cause awakenings, Lord. And that spiritual awakening for the first time for somebody as they step out of darkness and into light. As your spirit, Lord, convicts them of their sins and their need for a savior. And Lord, I pray for those who have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that, Lord, you continue to do a mighty work in them. And that each day, Lord, you'd cause us, Lord, to hunger and thirst for you. And to want to spend that time and just marvel at how magnificent you are. You're a wonderful God, worthy to be praised. And now, Lord, as we lift up our voices and sing, may it be a sweet sound to you. We'll give you the praise. We ask this in Jesus' name, who give us the right, the access to be able to speak with you. Thank you for that, Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.